Mist. A game that some see as a casual throwaway. A series of pretty pictures sold next to the After Dark screensaver collection at Office Depot. Others see the series as a collection of challenging puzzles in strange worlds. And then there are the diehard fans, the ones most people never knew existed, who quietly share in a fictional universe that its creators have constructed over the course of two decades. Mist exploded onto the scene in the early 90s, heralding a technical revolution and bringing gaming to audiences who had previously stayed away from the medium's ultra-violence and competitiveness. But it didn't end there. The series continued for over two decades, attracting a dedicated core fan base, yet garnering little to no mainstream attention before petering out into obscurity. A strange fate for what was once the best-selling, most popular game of all time. Cyan has just released Abduction, the spiritual successor to Myst, a game that takes the gameplay innovations and sense of wondrous mystery that the series is known for into a whole new world. It seems as good a time as any to look back at the long and winding history of the game and the company that was supposed to herald a revolution, and the decade's long attempt to recapture that lightning in a bottle. Welcome to Ludodrum, I'm Nate Behrens, and this is a brief history of, where I read the entire Wikipedia page so you don't have to. Rand and Robin Miller had been creating worlds for years before Myst. As far back as junior high, Rand programmed games on a mainframe computer at the University of New Mexico. His younger brother Robin studied art and music and spent nearly every waking moment painting or composing. Bored of working as a programmer for financial software, Rand stumbled onto a way to combine Robin's talents with his own, and in the late 80s he proposed that they collaborate on a computer game made using Apple Macintosh's HyperCard software. HyperCard was a precursor to the hypertext protocol that would underlie the burgeoning World Wide Web. It was created by Apple to allow non-programmers to create interactive applications by layering images with interactive clickable hotspots that link to other cards, images, animations, and other multimedia elements. The Miller brothers saw the potential for creating point-and-click adventure games in the format, stringing together static images linked by hotspots that would simulate moving through the world. First-person adventure games of the time generally relied on tiny graphical windows and lots of text describing the scene, while players interacted using a text parser. Through HyperCard, they could streamline that presentation. Together, they founded Cyan Productions in their parents' basement in Spokane, Washington. Cyan was founded by my brother and I, really for the purpose of making worlds. We just wanted to make places, not games. Their early projects were whimsical children's games. The Manhole was released in 1988 for the Macintosh, and had players descending into the titular Manhole to discover an Alice in Wonderland-esque fantasy world full of talking animals and goofy humor. Rand handled the programming, and Robin created the art and sound effects, while they shared design duties. At a game developer's conference postmortem, Robin stated that he started drawing the initial scenes of the Manhole in sequential fashion before reaching a point where he wasn't sure where to progress. And from there, the nature of the medium naturally pushed the Millers towards a non-linear structure. The manhole featured static black and white graphics and limited sound effects that were nevertheless extremely impressive on the Mac, which paled as a gaming platform compared to the other systems of the day. The game was later re-released by Activision on CD-ROM, making it the first game released on the then-fledgling platform. A year later, they released another children's game called Cosmic Osmo and the World Beyond the Mackerel, which should give you an idea of the tone of Cyan's early work. Cosmic Osmo utilized a video plugin for HyperCard that allowed for smooth animations to play over a static background, which allowed for a big jump in graphical quality. The world was still in black and white, but it was now full of life, with every screen crammed full of hotspots that triggered wacky animations. Cosmic Osmo put players in control of a spaceship that traveled between seven strange planets full of creatures and sights to discover. Notably, there were no puzzles. The game was more of a playground for the imagination than a challenge. At some point after Cosmic Osmo was released, the brothers decided that they wanted to work on a game geared towards an adult audience, and pitched an idea to Activision for a game called The Grey Summons. 
They wanted the players to be a catalyst in the story, one who had to approach complex issues and make ethical choices with consequences. Activision told them to stick to kids' games. So, disheartened and too broke to argue, they did. In 1991, Cyan released a third black and white hypercard game called Spelunks and the Caves of Mr. Pseudo. Similarly plotless and non-linear, Spelunks was more overtly educational than its predecessors, sending players into a series of puzzle rooms connected by underground tunnels. Each room had a theme connected with a specific branch of knowledge including math, biology, and physics. A significant chunk of the game's puzzles involved figuring out how to properly manipulate devices strewn about the caves, a theme that would become a mainstay of Cyan's work. In fact, while Myst was hailed upon release as revolutionary, much of the framework for its design is obvious in these earlier works. The intended audience is younger, and the tone is far less serious, but the minimalist storytelling is there, along with the open-ended exploration, the stripped-down interface, the lack of death or other serious consequences, and the player as the main character, rather than inhabiting an avatar or predetermined character. Even so, the games were not exactly leading the Millers to financial stability. They were struggling and seriously considering leaving the industry, especially after the rejection of the Grey Summons pitch. Then, Sunsoft, a Japanese publisher, approached them with an idea. What if Cyan made a game similar to the adventures they've been producing, but for an older audience? What a crazy idea. They went back to the pillars that had informed the Grey Summons pitch. A mature storyline, a more developed world, the player as protagonist, an ethical choice, and non-arbitrary puzzles. With no large fan base and no real expectations, Rand and Robin were free to design a world for themselves, one that appealed to their tastes and that they wanted to spend time in. Growing up with Lord of the Rings and uh, the Narnia series, uh, authors that built places um, definitely shaped us. Dungeons and & Dragons and Zork provided interactive storytelling and exploration techniques as well as puzzle design while C.S. Lewis and Jules Verne provided fantastical worlds to draw from, as well as the concepts of portals to other worlds, and quite literally, a mysterious island. They decided the game would take place on an island filled with cryptic puzzles. They wanted to have a variety of locations, but technical limitations forced them to compartmentalize the game space into discrete, separate zones, which led to the creation of ages, or unique separate worlds, that the player would teleport to via linking books and explore. The island was to be inhabited by two brothers, each trapped in prison books, and each trying to convince the player to free them, and them alone. The books allowed the brothers to communicate to the player, but provided an explanation and excuse for preventing the player from talking back. One major pillar in the pitch was to make the puzzles feel non-arbitrary and integrated into the world. The goal was to have all puzzles be solvable with common sense and observation. You're fixing a machine or discovering an alternate route instead of just solving a puzzle. It's arguable how much they succeeded in that, but nevertheless, they tried. According to the brothers, the name Mist popped up in conversation over the phone, and both Rand and Robin immediately fell in love with it and never looked back. With the design in place, the brothers pitched Mist to Sunsoft, and finally received the green light alongside a budget of $265,000. Before launching into production, the Millers playtested Mist in a tabletop RPG session, describing the environment to friends as a dungeon master would, and tracking their actions and responses. According to Robin, the session led to some major design changes before they'd ever rendered a single image. As for those images, the initial plan had called for hand-drawn, digitized graphics like Cyan's previous work, created by Robin. But early production tests worried him. Things weren't turning out as immersive or believable as he'd imagined. Searching for an alternative, he did some tests using 3D modeling software and was thrilled with the results. From that point on, Myst was going to be a 3D game with a distinctive cinematic look, rendered in Stratavision 3D and touched up in Photoshop 1.0. So, they had a set of interesting worlds and puzzles to fill them, and even a simple plot. Two brothers, Cirrus and Akinar, trapped on an island, both claiming to be wrongly imprisoned, both blaming the other. Which do you believe? Which do you free? However, they soon felt the story was too thin, and realized that for it to be satisfactory, they needed another element, a third character that would comment on the plot and complicate it. This led to the creation of Atris, the father of the two brothers, himself trapped in an age outside the island. 
Throughout development, this core story was developed further, as the Millers felt that they would be better able to create an interesting world if they had a deep backstory to draw upon. Borrowing from an unfinished novel of Robin's called Dunny Hut, they created a race of people called the Dunny, who existed apart from humans on Earth. The Dunny had the ability to create new worlds by writing in special books. They could then teleport to these worlds with separate linking books. Atris was a Dunny who had been forced to imprison his sons after they grew violent and greedy, terrorizing and enslaving the inhabitants of many of Atris's ages. Little of this content made it into the game itself, but the notes they compiled would later go on to inform the sequels and spin-off novels. In order to make the characters more believable, the Millers chose to use full motion video once the QuickTime format was released halfway through production. And as for the actors, where were they going to get two brothers? Despite lacking any acting background, they chose to play the roles themselves, with Robin portraying Cirrus and Rand playing both Akinar and Atris. Another element that came in later in production was the music. Mist was initially designed to use only ambient noise as a soundtrack, and when Broderbund, their distribution company, suggested adding music, the Millers felt that an external soundtrack would ruin the sense of immersion. We didn't want music interfering with the gameplay, and so we weren't going to put any music in. Um, when we finally did do a couple songs, we realized it wasn't an interference. It didn't sound like Super Mario Brothers. Uh, they seemed to really help the mood of certain places that, that you were at in the game. Robin composed a synthesized ambient soundtrack that has since become iconic. Mist was released in September 1993 for Mac OS, to rave reviews and an unusual amount of mainstream press coverage in the form of glowing, hyperbolic think pieces about the dawn of a new art form, or proof that video games were maturing from their adolescent phase. The game's simplicity and lack of violence drew in casual audiences who were turned off by the intense skill-based mechanics of most games, as well as the focus on non-stop carnage. That led to massive sales far beyond the meager expectations of Cyan and its publisher. Myst's realistic graphics, full motion video, and CD audio helped push sales of CD-ROM drives, making CDs a viable choice for delivering games well into the next decade. Myst was a bona fide phenomenon. People went out to buy computers just to play the game their friends were talking about. Myst quickly became the best-selling game of all time, an honor it held for nearly a decade until The Sims finally topped it in 2002. Looking back, Myst has not aged terribly well. The graphics retain some of their stark, evocative power, but they are hardly impressive. The ages lack a coherent aesthetic, and many of the elements feel random or out of place, like the 1950s-style rocket ship perched on a cliff, or the dentist chair in a planetarium. The puzzles, despite the Miller's best attempts, are often totally arbitrary, not to mention mouse-throwingly difficult and frustrating. Even so, the game remains atmospheric and compelling, a strange and fascinating game that feels alternately timeless and impossibly 90s. There was a maturity and purity to Myst that felt revolutionary at a time when video games were even more obsessed with adolescent power fantasy than today. And while gamers had known for a long time that their medium was capable of something more than just mindless entertainment, Myst finally got the rest of the world to look over and take notice. With the unprecedented reception, Rand and Robin became fast celebrities. They were heralded as geniuses, they were rich, and they had achieved that most elusive and undeniable sign of true success, their own Gap ad. So of course, there was going to be more Mist. Rand and Robin had not intended to make the backstory that they had created for Atris and his sons public, but after the positive reception of the game, they realized there was an audience for their lore. They wrote a novel telling the backstory of Atris leading up to the events of the first game. In it, we're introduced to Atris as a young boy growing up in the desert with his grandmother Anna, before being reclaimed by his estranged father, Gen, and taken to the now dead, crumbling ruin of the great city of Dunny, which lies deep underground. The novel introduces the conflict between Atris and his megalomaniac father, as well as Gen's personal age, Riven, and Atris' future wife, Catherine. Unhappy with the quality of their draft, they worked with author David Wingrove to rewrite the novel. 
Mist, The Book of Atris, was released to mixed reviews, but reached the bestseller list. A second novel followed a year later, also by Wingrove and the Millers. The Book of Tiana was a prequel that told the story of Atris's grandfather, Atris with an I, and Anna, a surface human who stumbled upon the city of Dunny. The book also covered the birth of Gen and the fall of Dunny. While not all-time classics, the Mist novels were surprisingly well-written and chock-full of fantastic world-building. For the core fans, in some ways, the novels marked the true beginning of the series, as they introduced the central pillars of the lore, the art of writing and the Dunny culture, elements that would play a much larger part in the next game. Development on the sequel to Mist began immediately. Cyan hired a larger team of collaborators, including former ILM and Disney artist Richard Vanderwend, whose credits included the movie Aladdin. Working under the title Equiquay, Cyan tackled its biggest project yet. The budget was ten times that of Mist, and the scope of the design was larger too. The sequel would be a direct continuation of Mist, and would tie more directly into the backstory that they had developed. Robin in particular had ambitious goals for telling a complex, mature story, feeling that the original Mist had been disappointingly simplistic. As the Atris ending of Mist teased, Atris's wife Catherine has been imprisoned by his father Gen on his own personal age of Riven. Atris begs the player to track down and rescue Catherine, while he stays behind amending the Book of Riven to keep the age from falling apart. Armed with the trap book, the player sets off to free Catherine and capture Gen, who has enslaved the inhabitants of the age. There's also a rebellion brewing among the inhabitants and, well, it's clear there's a lot more going on than in the original. Perhaps sensing that Equiquay is a terrible name, Cyan changed the title to Riven and began production. We were kind of like trying, we were stumbling around trying to find a style for this thing. Most of our stumbling around was still a little bit too much in the direction of mist. It still had a kind of that romantic architecture. Working with Richard Vanderwend, they developed a new style that felt grittier, earthier, and more weathered. This was a world that didn't just exist to be pretty. It was a world where animals lived their lives, where villagers ate, slept, and created. After he came, he imbued the whole project with a, a flavor that was a bit more edgy and strange and odd. Cyan graduated to SGI workstations and painstakingly modeled thousands of unique in-game objects down to the nails and screws. Textures were based on photographs taken during a trip to Santa Fe rather than digitally painted, and custom shaders were written to mimic the look of stone, water, sunlight, and more. Contributing to this leap towards photorealism was the evolving aesthetic of Riven. Riven is a single age comprised of multiple islands rather than the separate ages of the first game. While the islands have their own visual identities, they are clearly part of the same world, and every part of them serves a purpose beyond mere gameplay considerations. Where Mist's disparate architectural styles and biomes felt a bit thrown together, Riven felt like a real place. Buildings, machines, geographical features, and even children's toys were all designed to feel like part of a cohesive, natural world that had a history both geological and anthropological. Richard A. Watson, a programmer who had helped out on Mist in the final stretch, helped develop a written and spoken language and a system of numerals for the Dunny which featured prominently in the game. The puzzles were better integrated into the world this time, relying less on goofy abstract obstacles like musical notes, and more on concrete interactions with the world, like altering the flow of water through pipes and learning to count in dunny numerals. Not that this meant they were any easier. Riven is legendarily difficult, and I've yet to meet someone who finished the game without resorting to a guide. The fire marble puzzle in particular? Ugh. Yet the puzzles were fair and logical, devious and brilliant. Riven was a massive undertaking for Cyan, and it's not an exaggeration to say that everything was riding on its success. Despite growing the team with top-tier talent and throwing a huge budget at the project, the game was delayed from 1996 into late 97, causing publisher Broderbund's stock to plummet. As production dragged on, there was a sense of tension and weariness at the Cyan offices. Rand didn't see the necessity of spending so much extra time on tiny details that most players would never notice, yet Robin was obsessed with those same details. There were money worries, as they had refused to take outside money and were operating solely on Mist's profits. They all felt deeply passionate about the game, but they wanted it to be over and done with. And in October 1997, it was. Riven was released to critical praise and incredible sales success. It became the best-selling game of 1997 despite being released towards the end of the year. Yet there was a distinct lack of the same ecstatic mainstream attention that Mist received. 
Riven was a maturation of the concepts Myst had introduced, but it lacked the novelty, and the gaming world of 1997 was far different from 1993. Despite Myst's popularity, it had not ushered in an era of mature, minimalist games. There had been few imitators, and most of the industry proceeded as if Myst did not exist. And so while Riven was a critical and commercial success, it was not the second coming that some might have hoped for. That said, in many fans' opinions, Riven remains the pinnacle of the series. The art is gorgeous even today, the world still convincing, the story still compelling. The puzzles are occasionally too damn hard, but for the most part they are deeply satisfying to solve. There is an unmatched sense of place in Riven. Of any age in the entire series, Riven most feels like it truly exists fully formed out there somewhere, just waiting for someone to stumble onto it. Around this time, a third Myst book was released, The Book of Dunny, which continued the story of Atris as he and Catherine attempt to rebuild the destroyed Dunny society. The Book of Dunny is kind of a mess, with constant shifts in tone and a plot that feels more like a phoned-in Star Trek episode than an essential part of the Myst canon. The Millers have since admitted that it was rushed to meet Riven's release date. Shortly after the release of Riven, Robin left Cyan, citing frustration with his inability to tell the stories he wanted through games, and interviews from that time portray a weariness with the world of Myst. He went on to pursue a variety of other projects in music and film. Richard Vanderwend also left, leaving Cyan in the care of only one of its essential creative minds, Rand. From the outside, it appeared that Cyan went quiet for years. Rand Miller and Cyan with him were not interested in creating more Myst sequels in the same vein as Riven. They wanted to experiment, and to that end, Cyan and Mattel decided to outsource production of further Myst sequels, while Cyan stayed out of the limelight and quietly worked on their own follow-up project, known at the time only by its codename, Dirt, for Dunny in Real Time. They began soliciting pitches from numerous developers, asking them to provide story and environment concepts, analyses of the first two games, and technical demonstrations. Two pitches were accepted, one from Presto Studios, makers of the Journeyman Project series, and the other from Dreamforge Entertainment, creators of Sanitarium. Soon, Myst 3 and 4 were in development. Presto Studios had a long pedigree of making pre-rendered adventure games. The Journeyman Project series had been going strong for years and was well-loved, if nowhere near as successful as Myst. Their analysis of the first two games led to certain design pillars for the third. First, they wanted to return to the visual variety of the first game, with its discrete ages, rather than the single age of Riven. Second, they wanted to give players a way to gauge their progress to the game, as neither Myst nor Riven had given a clear indication of how much was left. Finally, they wanted a dramatic and satisfying ending. The Presto team also wanted a more coherent, self-contained storyline, one that didn't rely so much on subtle inferences through the environment like Riven. Writer Mary DeMarle's initial plan was to bring back Cirrus and Akinard and continue their story, but that idea was already in use by Dreamforge, and she was forced to develop a new concept from scratch. Myst 3, Exile, takes place ten years after Riven. Atris and Catherine have been focused on locating the survivors of Dunny and helping them rebuild their society. Atris writes a new age for the survivors to live in, Relation, while the rebuilding happens. A new character, Saavedro, breaks into Atris's study and steals the Relation book before linking away. The player manages to follow Saavedro and must recover the stolen book in order to secure a future for the Dunny. Presto made the decision to stay with the pre-rendered 3D graphics the series was known for, as real-time graphics would require high-end computer hardware that many Myst players lacked. While the graphics remained pre-rendered, they added the ability to pan 360 degrees in any direction, an advancement in video technology allowed for the world to include more animated effects such as waves or ripples of water. Without Robin Miller to provide the music, Presto needed a new composer. They turned to Jack Wall, who was given instructions to create a new sound that remained recognizably missed. After immersing himself in the first two games and their soundtracks, he produced a new orchestral score that was at times bombastic and action-packed while retaining the quiet mystery and majesty of Miller's work.
Exile was released in May 2001 by Ubisoft, who purchased the rights from Mattel. They marketed the game with far less fanfare than its predecessors. Years had passed since Myst was in the spotlight, and Presto lacked even the fading celebrity status of the Miller brothers. While the game was well received and sold fairly well, there was no great acclaim, no adulation of a work of genius. Critics accused the game of being a relic of a time past, of having lost its relevance. Myst 3 is a perfectly fine game, with a compelling villain played by the wonderfully weird Brad Dourif, and gorgeous worlds to explore. The puzzles are satisfying, if a bit easy, and of course there is great pleasure to be found in wandering around listening to Jack Wall's amazing score. But it is missing a little something. The ages you visit in exile were designed by Atris as tests for his sons, and thus they exist primarily to house puzzles. They lack the sense of place and history that made Mist and especially Riven so compelling. It's as if you're visiting a series of very cool desktop wallpapers rather than a series of worlds. Not bad, just not the same. Still, creating a worthy sequel to a legendary game series is no easy task, and Presto did the misname justice. Unfortunately, Presto closed not long after Exile's release. The second pitch Cyan accepted was from Dreamforge Entertainment for a game with the working title Myst 4 Adventure Beyond the Dunny Ultraworld, a name that should never have left the brain of the guy who suggested it. The game was never shown publicly before being cancelled when Ubisoft took over the franchise, though assets from the unfinished game have made their way online. It was to be the first real-time 3D Myst game, and the leaked footage actually looks quite nice, but sadly, the game was not to be. In the early 2000s, Cyan began releasing details about their next project. Cyan had spent years working on a new 3D engine, using an early version of its tech to create Real Mist, a full 3D recreation, which was released in 2000 along with an updated re-release of the original called Mist Masterpiece Edition. Easter eggs in the Masterpiece Edition and Real Mist revealed the first screenshot of the game that came to be known by the codename MudPie, which stood for Multi-User Dirt Personal Interactive Environment. That's right, not only was Myst going 3D, it was going online. The goal for MudPie was to create a shared online version of Dunny, in which players could interact and team up to explore an ever-growing roster of ages. Instead of telling the story of Atris's family, MudPie would take place in the modern day. While earlier works had hinted that the Cavern of Dunny existed on Earth, MudPie presumed that the cavern had been discovered by archaeologists under the New Mexico desert and opened for exploration. Players would control an avatar from third person for the first time, and the game would be subscription supported, allowing Cyan to continually release new content that would be delivered over a broadband connection. Even the name of the company was changed to Cyan Worlds to emphasize this new focus. The idea was revolutionary then, and remains so today. A massively multiplayer exploration and puzzle game, with Cyan employees taking on roles in the game and interacting live with players who might in turn affect the direction of the narrative. A storyline that evolves in real time, a constant supply of new worlds to explore and solve, and even, eventually, a way for players to create their own world, to take part in the art of writing. Over the next few years, a slow drip of screenshots, videos, and information was released, and the diehard Myst fans lapped up each drop with increasing fervor. With the online components taking extra long to develop, Ubisoft requested that Cyan release a single-player portion of the game to retail. Cyan grudgingly put together a story mode that took players through some of MudPie's content, and in 2003, Uru, Ages Beyond Mist, was released as a single-player, standalone introduction that would eventually hook into the online component, Uru Live. Uru is a strange game, even by Cyan's standards. Not only does it break with Mist's traditions at almost every step, third-person, platforming, real-time graphics, etc. But it is clearly torn between its single-player story obligations and its online, persistent world aspirations. Some ages feel empty and unfinished, cobbled together with half-implemented ideas, while others are teeming with detail and mystery. The puzzles are hit and miss as well. Many seem to have been designed with multiplayer in mind, only to be jerry-rigged into a single-player format that is more frustrating than fulfilling. The journey cloths, seven in each age, are a bland and joyless goal that give no real sense of satisfaction. And the plot is as bare bones as can be. Yisha, with her tribal tattoos, new agey magic, and preachy anti-dunny attitude is a poor substitute for Atris's gravitas. 
Yet, despite all of its issues, Uru has its moments. At its best, Uru's ages feel like truly ancient worlds rather than puzzle-filled obstacle courses, and exploring locations that had been key to the mist lore was thrilling. The cleft where Atrus was raised, for one, and of course, getting the first glimpses of Egura, the Dunny Cavern itself. But it was clearly meant as a stopgap to buy time until Uru Live was ready. Uru is a strange, sloppy game, but one that gives players a glimpse of Cyan's great ambitions. Which makes it all the more tragic when, in 2004, right as Cyan was gearing up to launch, Ubisoft pulled the plug, citing a company-wide move away from online gaming. Uru Live, just like that, was dead. But Myst 4, developed in-house by Ubisoft after the cancellation of Dreamforge's Ultraworld concept, was very much alive. Ubisoft Montreal, the studio responsible for games like Splinter Cell and Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, had begun development on the fourth Myst game shortly after acquiring the license. It was the first pre-rendered game they had ever worked on, and soon they found themselves struggling in pre-production with a lack of experience. After hiring 50 artists, they had the opposite problem too many experienced artists with nothing to do, as the design was still coming together. This led to a conflicted relationship between the design and art departments that lasted throughout the project and caused a high turnover rate. Almost no one from the initial pre-production team remained when the game shipped. Weekly team lead meetings were reduced to griping sessions, and less than a year out from release, none of the game's areas were in a finished state. The producers made the decision to shift the team structure into small, multidisciplinary teams that would focus solely on specific portions of the game, and soon after, things finally started to come together, and the mood brightened significantly. With Myst 3, Presto had been banned from using Cirrus and Akinar, but Cyan encouraged the Myst 4 team to center the plot around the brothers. Mary DeMarl returned as writer, penning a plot that had Cirrus and Akinar escaping from their prison ages and kidnapping their younger sister, Yisha who had previously been seen as an infant in Myst 3. Myst 4 Revelation is the most story-heavy game in the series, full of character development and action, at least what passes for action in a Myst game. It is the end point of the move from Myst's minimalism toward a much more direct experience. The first puzzle in the game has you assisting Atrus in his laboratory, following his explicit directions to adjust dials and switches just so. Try moving the slider to select a different signal. Now adjust the center dial. The center dial seems well adjusted. No, stop, the frequency was good. The polar opposite of the original's total lack of handholding. The game even gives you a necklace that reveals flashbacks to past events, a far more explicit method of providing backstory than anything in the series before. It makes sense in a way. The mystery of the initial games had subsided, and now we were left with characters that we knew well, who inhabited a universe whose rules had been set down. The draw was no longer to discover just what was going on, but rather to find out what was going to happen next. Yet it's arguable just how mist-like that approach really is. Graphically, the game is by far the most polished of the series. The pre-rendered backgrounds are higher resolution and have an impressive amount of animation that brings the world to life in a way that the previous games can't match. Trees sway in the wind, bugs zip through the air, windmills toil away in the distance. Atris and Catherine's home of Tomana is a joy to explore, and is one of the most fully realized locations in the entire series. Yet the game's troubled development is obvious in its uneven quality. Puzzles range from devious and clever to utterly arbitrary and illogical. The acting is uniformly terrible, and the story goes in some very unmist-like directions involving spirit guides and dream magic. Still, the game provides a satisfying conclusion to the story of Atris and his sons, and is worth playing. Revelation was released in 2004, and was pretty well received. By this point, though, Myst's particular brand of adventure felt more and more like a relic of the past. While it was a very good one of those games, it no longer inspired much awe. After the cancellation of Uru Live, Cyan was struggling financially and sitting on top of years of work that had gone nowhere. Ubisoft suggested repackaging that work into expansion packs for Uru. Without much room to argue, Miller agreed, and Cyan released Uru to Dunny and Path of the Shell in 2004. With the expansions in place, Uru felt like a much richer world. 
to Dunny finally gave players access to the cavern itself, and while the gameplay may have been quite sparse, exploring Agura was a dream come true for many players. Path of the Shell added several new ages and continued Uru's story, though it didn't quite finish it. Yet Cyan was under obligation to deliver one more title. With some remaining unused assets intended for Uru Live and a number of loose ends to the plot, Cyan decided to cobble together a game that would put a bow on the series that had started over a decade earlier. Myst 5 End of Ages was announced as the final chapter in the series. Publicly, the game was poised as the culmination of the entire series, the thrilling finale to a decade-long epic, while internally, it was a desperate attempt to turn years of unused work into something that could help keep the company afloat. This meant that unlike the pre-rendered graphics of Myst 1 through 4, End of Ages would use the Uru engine, and the ages you explored would be salvaged from Uru Live's archives. The game returned to the first-person perspective of the mainline Myst games, but allowed for free roaming through the real-time 3D environments alongside the traditional point-and-click interface. The game would be more accurately called Uru 2, as it has very little to do with Atris's story. Like Uru, it takes place in the modern day, some 200 years after the events of the first game. The player, exploring Dunny, is approached by an adult Yisha to take an artifact known as the Tablet that has the ability to control a mysterious race known as the Baro. However, the player also meets Escher, a survivor of the fall of Dunny, who warns that Yisha has been driven mad by the Tablet and cannot be trusted. The player must travel to four ages to find slates that will return the Tablet's full power and then decide who should be trusted with it, a decision that has consequences for entire civilizations. The game's origin as an attempt to make some use out of Urulai's cancellation is obvious from the get-go. The plot feels like a thin excuse to jump to four random ages that are largely empty and non-interactive, lacking the thorough attention to detail that is the cornerstone of the franchise. There are some gorgeous sights to see, but little else of note. Yisha grates more than ever, whining about her destiny incessantly, and while Escher is initially compelling, his constant interruptions become tiresome. The addition of the tablet and its use in some puzzles is interesting but quickly becomes repetitive, and the concept of using the same item over and over again to solve most puzzles feels at odds with the series' standards. There honestly isn't much to say about End of Ages. It's not a train wreck, but it feels lifeless and half-baked. It's clearly the product of a rushed, desperate development rather than the passion projects that made Cyan famous. It's a disappointing note for the series to end on, though completionists will find some value in seeing it through to the end, as it's not without a few surprises and effective appeals to nostalgia. After Myst 5, Cyan was in dire financial trouble. Ren Miller was forced to lay off all but two employees, and the company was on the verge of shutting down. He managed to, in his words, pull a rabbit out of a hat and negotiate a deal with Turner Broadcasting in what would become a partnership with their game streaming service GameTap, which secured enough funding to rehire nearly everyone. Kept afloat by releasing mobile ports of their old games, Cyan began development on a new title codenamed Lattice. They also decided to release a free, player-hosted version of whatever content they had for Uru Live, one that would lack content updates or the live storytelling that had been so important to the concept but would at least get players in the cavern. Until Uru only lasted a few months before being shut down, only this time it was with good news. At E3 2006, Cyan and GameTap announced the fruit of their partnership. Myst Online, Uru Live, was going to launch through GameTap within the next year, and after a round of beta testing, it finally launched in early 2007. For a year, Myst Online existed almost as it had intended though years of financial trouble had left Cyan less than able to deliver on its ambitious plans. New content was scarce, and eventually plans were shifted from constant live updates to less frequent episodic releases. For that year, though, faithful fans inhabited the cavern, sharing in a live storytelling experience and creating many of their own. Players organized cavern social events, analyzed the game's secrets, and began planning their own ages. It was sometimes hard to tell who was a Cyan employee role-playing as a character, and who was simply a player. Though much of the game was familiar content from Uru's single-player releases, players were drawn in by the unique sense of community that only a small, struggling niche game can create. Of course, small niche communities do not successful MMOs make, and despite the passionate support of its community, Myst Online was shut down only a year and a half later due to lack of subscribers. 
Over the next few years, Cyan would attempt to keep the dream alive through a free, donation-supported server, and eventually releasing all of Mist Online's source code free to the community to do with as they wished. A dedicated few remain on these fan-run servers, but in the end, Mist Online marks both the high point for Cyan World's ambition and the low point for its failure. Cyan went quiet after Mist Online's shutdown, occasionally releasing a port or re-release of Mist, or releasing its games on Steam. There had been no word of their lattice project for years, and it seemed that the company, fed up with dealing with large publishers, was going to settle into place as a sort of holding company for the Mist property. In the meantime, something strange happened. The Millers had once stated that, after being told over and over again that they had reinvented computer games, they had waited for the imitators to come and they never did. Outside of a few low-budget adventure games, no one tried to do what Mist had done, or even really anything close. It turns out that Mist's influence had been far-reaching, but that influence would not be felt in mainstream AAA games. The costs were too high, the risks too great, but the rise of indie games starting in 2008 led to a renaissance of many genres, among them a new wave that cherished atmosphere, puzzles, and storytelling over fast action or spectacle. Games like Braid, Dear Esther, and Gone Home owed much of their design to science experiments, and now we live in a world where games like The Witness and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture are not only given wide release, but are featured on stage at E3. A generation of gamers had grown up with Myst, and now they were making games that spoke to that history. Alongside the indie renaissance, another fundamental change in the gaming industry gave Cyan another chance to produce something new and exciting. Ren Miller has been quoted as saying that the smartest way to run a business is with someone else's money, but the most satisfying way is to use your own. That was his way of saying that working with publishers was an exhausting, demoralizing experience, and no wonder considering his history with Ubisoft. Kickstarter offered a revenue stream that gave developers a way to raise funding for a game without being beholden to a publisher. Instead, they were beholden to thousands of paying, passionate customers who could simultaneously be more understanding and far more demanding. More and more developers, many of them famous for their work in the 90s, were turning to Kickstarter and finding great success, raising millions toward passion projects that harkened back to their glory days. It seemed like a perfect fit for Cyan. They decided, what the hell, let's try it. Rather than trying to kickstart their larger, more ambitious Lattice project, they went with a smaller, more familiar pitch, and the Kickstarter for Abduction launched in 2013 and raised $1.3 million. So the idea behind abduction is, is really to provide that same experience you had when you landed on the dock on Mist Island, that same feeling when you touched down and said, why am I here, what am I doing, and you just set out to explore. Abduction used the Unreal Engine 4 and marked the first time that Cyan's real-time graphics could stand up next to their pre-rendered work. And as a nod to their earlier work, Abduction would feature full-motion video actors superimposed into the world. As in Myst 5, players could move freely or use a point-and-click interface, and for the first time, the game would be developed with virtual reality in mind. Rand reached out to his brother Robin late in the project, and Robin agreed to compose the score, marking their first collaboration since Riven. Abduction was released in August 2016. And while it's too early to tell if it will have a lasting impact, it has been warmly received as a return to form for Cyan, and a beautiful, challenging adventure game in its own right. In an interview with Eurogamer shortly after Abduction's launch, Rand Miller reacted to the reception. I gotta say, it's been a good day. It's been just shy of three years. You start out the morning of shipping, not knowing how the reviews are gonna be, and it's like, oh good, it's a good day. Where does Cyan go from here? There are side projects that have been on the back burner for years. The fourth Mist book, The Book of Merim, has been in the works for over a decade, 
and there have been on-again, off-again plans for a Mist TV series that inch ever closer to fruition. But the prospect of Cyan breaking away from Mist and tackling new, original ideas is perhaps even more exciting. After all, what made Mist special was the sense of venturing into the unknown, of discovering new worlds and teasing them apart. As much as I personally love the Mist series, I have felt the diminishing returns of going back to the well. Mist is lessened when it's familiar, and abduction proves that Cyan has other fascinating worlds in them. Where does Cyan go from here? I'm excited to say, I don't know.